koutou, e nā reo, e nā mana, e nā iwi, tēnā koutou, ko tāmai nei ki te manaaki i te kaupapa o te rā, nō re rā, nō mai, haramai. Welcome everyone, uh, my name is Fisher Wang, I am the MC for today's proceedings. Uh, I'm a councillor on Rotorua Lakes Council and I'm very lucky to also be the cultural ambassador as well. So um, great, uh, it's great to be here to support uh, Mike and Blake for their launch um, of this book today. I'd like to welcome the High Commissioner, Her, uh, Her Excellency Miss Tulelo, VIPs, our distinguished panel members here. Webinar participants and all those watching around the world. We have people from the United Kingdom, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, and I'm sure from many more countries. Here we are in Otorua, tourist capital of the North Island, with the largest geyser in the Southern Hemisphere. We have a beautiful natural environments so people can enjoy mountain biking, a swim in the lake, or go for a run in the forest. We're also very lucky and very proud to be the first bilingual city in New Zealand. So wherever you are, when COVID restrictions end, please do come visit and we will welcome you with open arms. So let's move on to this exciting day and why we are all here. The Kruger Millions, one of the world's greatest treasure mysteries. Is this the great reveal? Is the truth, is a real story about to be uncovered? Is it gonna be the debunking of the myth? I'm very excited because both Mike and Blake have strong Rotorua links. Mike has lived here for over eight years and Blake is trying to reunite with his Rotorua family and through MIQ, which many other families are unfortunately experiencing because of the pandemic. Until last week, I never knew about the Kruger Millions. I never knew about the story. But after I read the book, what a story it is. The expose, conspiracy, the treasure mystery, and history buffs? Rewriting the history books by providing a broader, more accurate definition of the missing Kruger millions, debunking the century-held myth and exposing, exposing it as a ruse which hides the sinister, grand-scale blundering of the South African state wealth. I will now draw your attention to the website down here where you'll be able to find more information. But if we move on to the background of how this book came to be. Firstly, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Marguerite Theron. She is a, a active member of our Rotorua community and also the chair of our uh, Rotorua Multicultural Council. She grew up in South Africa so firstly, Marguerite, my first question to you was, who was Kruger and what was this war all about? Thank you, Fisher. Paul Kruger was the president of an Afrikaner Republic, which was also later known as the Transvaal. That fairly new republic was really struggling financially until the richest gold fields in the world were discovered in Johannesburg. The British, of course, then became very keen to control that gold, and that resulted in the Anglo-Boer War. About 6,500 New Zealanders fought on the British side in the Anglo-Boer War, and that was the first time that Kiwi soldiers had ever fought a war outside of their own country. One outcome of that Anglo-Boer War was the formation of South Africa as we know it today. The impact of the Anglo-Boer War can still be seen around New Zealand. There are, for example, many Boer War memorials in, in New Zealand cities and towns, and just a few hundred metres from there, there is an Anglo-Boer War memorial. There are also street names in Rotorua, such as Pretoria Street, which also commemorates those links between the two countries. President Kruger was respected by many as the David who took on the Goliath of the mighty British Empire. 
He died in exile in Switzerland, but today he is still revered by many as one father figure of the Afrikaner nation. His legacy lives on today and he is remembered with statues and town names and also the famous Kruger National Park in South Africa and the most widely used gold currency in the world today, the Kruger Rand. This is a Kruger Rand with his image on the one side and this coin contains exactly one ounce of gold and the price goes up and down day by day as the price of gold goes up and down and today this coin is worth 1,780 American dollars. So that is some background, Fisher. Thank you, Margaret. Um, thank you for sharing with us um, your treasure and showing us what a uh, Kruger Rand looks like. Um, it's amazing to see the, how history and some, sometimes dark bits of history has shaped our community and our world as we know it now. Um, I'd like to move on to Richard Booker um, from the New Zealand uh, Numismatic Society. What is the Kruger Lost Horde and why is it so significant? How does that relate to the book? It's so significant because, Fisher, thank you, that uh, as a numismatist I've been interested in collecting coins for many years and as a member of the Royal New Zealand Numismatic Society and the Tarama Numismatic Society we have heard a long, long time ago about the missing hoard from South Africa. Of course, South African coins are very, very famous for being very, very low mintage. Uh, there are not a great many of them in existence. So when the British got to Pretoria, they were expecting to find about 183,000 ounces of gold. Unfortunately, when they arrived, there was a lot less than that. So the question then becomes, where did it go? And that is a, the mystery of Kruger's missing millions. That gold today would be worth about 480, 490 million dollars, so we're talking a fairly substantial sum. The South African Mint has recently announced that they have discovered uh, Hoard which they purchased from Switzerland of 233 half pond and 677 full pond coins from the uh, South African Republic. And they're currently selling them together with a modern 2019 uh, coin to go with it, saying it was part of the Lost Hoard, or at least it's advertised the Lost Hoard. Unfortunately, I think that that's far too small and it's nowhere near even a proportion of it. It's likely that that was probably smuggled out with either Kruger or one of his friends when they actually departed and wasn't part of the main consignments that were, we believe, somewhere in Switzerland. Having a mint bag like that turn up out of the blue from over 100 years later in a mint in Switzerland, um, or in a vault in Switzerland, in the original South African mint bag, gives credence to some of the material that's outlined in the book. So I'll pass it back to you. Thank you, Fisher. Thank you, Richard. Um, we can definitely see the many flow-on effects that that has had and hopefully will reveal many of the mysteries that are in this book. Uh, I'm, I'm going to move on to uh, Chris Griffin. Unfortunately, Chris couldn't be here with us today. Um, he is Brown's grandson and so the question that I have for him is who was Brown and what made him special, and why is this book so special to the family? Thomas Brown was my grandfather. Served in the Boer War and the First World War. I never met him and know that he was part of the first contingent. That is the first New Zealand forces to serve overseas. When they left Wellington in October 1899, there would never have been such a large gathering of people to, to ever have assembled in the history of New Zealand at this time. In South Africa, he was part of the New Zealand Mounted Rifles, a rank of bugler and this 
the bugle he played while he was there we still have today. My grandfather kept a diary and later wrote down his war memories, but they were never published. He seemed fascinated with the Kruger millions. There is a painting of him in the War Arts Library of New Zealand and it shows him holding a diary. It is the only Boer War painting in the Arts Library. Decades later he became the president of the First Contingents Association, an active group which provided support for each other. He loved tramping and there was a track named after him in the hills surrounding Wellington. Today he is buried together with 20 others, First Contingent Conrads in Karori Cemetery. Thank you, Chris. I'd like to now move on to the comment from the authors of this book. Firstly, I'd like to introduce Blake. Blake is a journalist, a writer, and a permanent resident of New Zealand. Like I mentioned before, unfortunately, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, he is struggling to come back home to New Zealand, but I hope we can join with him soon. Mike is an amateur historian, I think he's more historian, we can probably scratch the amateur part, who has published another book, Walter Callaway, a Māori warrior of the Boer War. So Mike, sitting next to me, is going to give an overview of the journey through the project of the book. Thank you, Fisher. Tēnā koutou, khrutaan ama di bulise noonke. Firstly, I want to thank Blake. It's been a great journey and a great collaborative project. Wouldn't have happened without WhatsApp. Plenty early morning calls to make up that time difference with South Africa and uh, in, in the evenings as well. It also wouldn't have happened without the support and, and forbearance of our, our wives Margot and Wendy. Thank you for that. And a special mention also to the publishers Quick Fox in Cape Town. As you can see with the book, it's a superb uh, production. For me, Looted Gold has, has been really enjoyable on a number of levels. I've really enjoyed the close links with my family history. And Paul Kruger was, was baptised by, uh, by my great-great-grandfather in 1826. And both my grandfathers were in the South African War. One incarcerated in a POW camp in Pretoria at the same place in Dustport where, where this gold encounter took place. So the research has taught me a lot more about my own family history and my own family heritage. Secondly, I've, I've really enjoyed the bilateral links which the story brings and being a New Zealand and South African citizen that does warm my heart. I've always enjoyed people's stories right from the school days to when I was a mere Marty of Stellenbosch. And Looted Gold certainly highlights many of those kinds of stories, even though it might be seen through a different lens. I can also say that when researching this book, it's been a bit like peeling an onion. Just when you think all the facts were sorted, something new would emerge and this would force a substantial rewrite. It does have many layers. Never did we believe that when first reading the memoirs of Thomas Brown's life-threatening fact, um, his life-threatening experiences of gold at Dustport, that would lead us to major issues such as significant Swiss involvement in the, in the gold-based economy of South Africa. And we hope that this journey will continue. Blake and I have really enjoyed making this book. It's been a lot of fun. And, and we just uh, have the same hope for you that you would enjoy it as well. So thank you to everybody who's joining us for the launch 
and everyone who has helped in whatever way to make this book a reality. Norera Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Katoa. Thank you, Mike, and thank you for sharing the history behind why you have uh, put together this project and creating this book. Um, it's very meaningful and you can feel it from your explanation. Um, I'd like to now move on to Blake, um, and unfortunately Blake is unable to join us, so we have a clip of him again. Um, so my question to Blake is, how was Thomas Brown's memoirs first discovered, and also how, or what was so remarkable about his experience in Dustport? Thank you for that introduction, Fisher. I'm keen to get back home to Rotorua, but COVID seems to uh, have other ideas. Mike and I have worked on this book for more than three years. It's been quite a wild journey because we've changed direction as new information has come to hand. I think we've read hundreds of books, research papers, letters and newspaper reports. That probably amounts to millions of words and we've managed to refine that down to around 55,000 words through diligent discussion and some pretty hefty pruning. You know, I've been asked by various people to explain what motivated Mike and me to write about the Kruger Millions. Well, serendipity is a strange and, and a quirky creature at the best of times. It caught Mike and me off guard a few years back. Wendy and I enjoy hiking and we decided to tackle the magnificent Tongariro Alpine crossing some time ago. As you know, you hike between three live volcanoes, so it's something that was high on our bucket list. Chris Griffin, who at the time was the owner of a boutique hotel where we stayed before the hike, noticed my interest in the Boer War and he gave me a copy of the unpublished memoirs of his great-grandfather, Thomas Brown. It turned out that Brown uh, had seen action in the Boer War in 1899 and 1900. By chance he'd been present during a midnight search for buried gold on the farm of Fricky Edolf, who is Paul Kruger's son-in-law. What we read in Brown's memoirs was that he and other Kiwi soldiers had been deployed as guards at the, Freely, um, at the Fri Fricky Edolf farm at Dustport, which is just outside Pretoria. Brown was ordered to accompany the Secret Service officer and two wagon drivers on a search for buried gold in the dead of night on the farm. They couldn't find the gold. The next day, Brown saw Elof's Swiss farm worker hand over two to three thousand gold coins to the Secret Service officer. Elof was present at the time. So the write-up in Brown's published memoirs essentially comprise the embers that were stirred up into a fire that has consumed Mike and me for all these years. Thank you, Blake. Um, from your speech, I think we can definitely all feel that enormous amounts of effort um, digging um, through history to put together this story and that sometimes it may be controversial but it all still forms part of the history of this story. We're very, I'm very excited for this ne next section um, as we get some snippets from inside the book. We have the authors here to share some thoughts and so moving on I'd just like to explain how very unique this story or this book is in that at the start of every chapter there is a graphic, related graphic and title and you might have noticed some familiar faces in the story. So I'd like to move on to Blake and again we have a video clip from him um, to share something about the chapter 4 title page. As we write on page 61 of Looted Gold, and I quote, Kruger's loyalty to members of his extended family has been widely documented. His approach of giving 
unqualified support to family members underlined as penchant for undisguised nepotism. Unquote. The Kruby Elof dynasty grew out of an exodus of Dutch speaking farmers who loaded up their wagons in the 1830s and headed out of the Cape Colony northwards into Africa. The journey into the interior of South Africa is known as the Great Trek. Um, these farms were known as Boers and they were seeking new lands on which to settle that were not dominated by the British at that time. The Kruger and Elof families were amongst those who headed north. Sorrel Elof and Paul Kruger became firm friends from the time of the Great Trek in 1836. They both served in the First Boer War against the British. Their friendship continued after Kruger began, became president and in later years Elof's sons Fricky and Jan served as Kruger's personal secretary as did one of Fricky's sons in later years. Fricky married Kruger's daughter Elsie. Kruger and Fricky also bought farms in partnership. Reserves of gold and coal were discovered on some of those farms. And coincidentally, Jan Elof, who was the second mining commissioner based in Thank you, Blake. Now, I'd like to move on to Mike. Uh, chapter 6, the Swiss involvement in the gold sector. What's new and what was surprising about that? Great. Um, I think the next one, um, Sean. Next one on there. Six, yeah. That's it, great, thank you. So, one surprise of the research which Blake and I did was the, the, the extent of the the Swiss involvement um, in the gold. Um, and the picture you see is the ZAR, the Zuid-Afrikaanse uh, Republikse Mint, and which was in, run entirely by Swiss workers. So when did the Swiss involve themselves in, in the gold sector? It might surprise people to know that that started even before gold was discovered in Johannesburg. In 1873, uh, Kruger's predecessor summoned the, the Swiss national uh, parent to Pretoria. And within a year, the blueprint for the gold-based economy and full costing of the mint was presented to President Burgers. So since those very early days, those Swiss ties with South African gold has remained solid, even in recent times more particularly in the 80s with the, um, in the, with the apartheid government. Blake and I were in contact with Professor Peep from Basel in Switzerland. He's the watchdog of the Swiss bank ethics and morality around gold procurement with the banks. And uh, he made a lot of research and focus with the, the, with the Nazis, with the apartheid South Africa, and even in Rwanda during the, the genocide and Swiss involvement there. So, not even he was aware of the Swiss involvement uh, in the Boer Republics. So, today, the Swiss deal with 70% of the world's traded gold. And the question with, through the book we arises is, could the ZAR have helped establish them to be the world leaders in gold trading as they are today? Looted gold deals with these issues, and from even before Kruger's time until the election of the first apartheid government and beyond. For most, these might be new revelations, and this is what makes the book exciting. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. It's um, very interesting to see how the Swiss have had such an impact on this throughout history um, relating to this subject. So now let's move on to chapter 14, the challenge. What happened to this wealth? Could anyone still have access to it? Hmm. So usually when one brings up the topic of the Kruger Millions or the Kruger Milliona, people's eyes grow big and they generally ask, 
far is it? Where is it? Where is the goal? Tell us where it is. Most people believe, even today, that it is buried somewhere near the Mozambique border. And that's the myth. And that's the debunking of the myth which comes through our book. The pointers are clear that all this vast amount of wealth was securely, safely secured in, in European banks. And that it's this pro process would have started not at the time when Kruger left to go into exile, but would have started to happen even a decade, many, many years before he left. So that brings the next obvious question with all this wealth that's, ab that's abroad. Who, has got, who had access to it? And who has got access to it today? Looted gold highlights golden pointers, golden threads with people and with events from the time of Kruger's presidency, presidency his exile, his death in Switzerland, the rise of Afrikaner nationalism, through to the rise of apartheid-led governments. And although our pointers do give new perspectives and new leads, it's not conclusive proof. That will only happen once access to the secret accounts to those bank vaults is permitted. More recently, with the developments like the, the Panama Papers, this is now becoming more possible. So Blake and I encourage others to read the book, learn about these new perspectives, and then explore and, and investigate further. That is the challenge. Could it be your challenge? Thank you, Mike. So that is just a small taster of the exciting content within this book. You will have to get the book to continue on this journey and unearth those mysteries. Now, to sum, to sum up some comments, impressions and expectations. And firstly, I'd just like to say, throughout this evening, we've truly seen that this is an international project. Um, the graphics in the book have been created in Pakistan and Sri Lanka. And there has been input from all around the world, from people all around the world. So I'd like to start with Marguerite. Being a member of the South African community, what makes this book so personally intriguing? To me, there are two things. The one is that I studied South African history for 12 years at school. And this book, I haven't read the whole book, but even the first few chapters has given me completely new insight. So it's absolutely fascinating read and beautifully produced as well. And then the other aspect that I really enjoy are all the links between my new home country and my original home country. All the links in so many different ways between South Africa and New Zealand. Thank you for sharing that, Marguerite. And it's very interesting to hear about the history and learn about the history as compared to, to being in school and compared to actually being in the big wide world and the, um, what we learn from that. So moving on to Chris Griffin, who was Brown's grandson. Why is it exciting for the family? Can we have a clip? Uh, it's where you That's right. On behalf of the Griffin family, and as a grandson of Thomas Brown, we are very proud to have him acknowledged and remembered through this, the book of Looted Gold. It is very satisfying that all his writings in his diary and his memoirs are now published for others to see and enjoy. Congratulations to Blake and Mike on the book and hope it becomes a successful publication. Thanks. On behalf of... Thank you, Chris. And now moving on to Richard. Being a member of the Numismatic Society, why do you find this a great read? And is there a more plausible explanation of what happened? I find it a great read because it starts to delve into the exact reasons 
why the, uh, the South African Republic uh, lost the war against the British. Um, it would be interesting to see a re re uh, revisionist history as to what would have happened if the money that was found in Johannesburg stayed in South Africa. Um, another 37,000 Morsa rifles may have certainly helped uh, turn the tide. Um, when you look at the gold mines in South Africa and you look at the significance of it, the significance of it is that it was at one stage 75-25% of the world's gold production. So we're talking huge amounts of gold and huge amounts of money. Of course as numismatists we are very interested in knowing what the coins were, where were they minted, how were they minted, where, what cooperation did they have and so the Swiss involvement is of great interest, of course the Swiss being renowned very much for their quality. And of course we're also very interested from the historical angle with the production of the Krugerrands at point uh, 0.917, I believe, the same sort of fineness as the uh, original pond. Ironically also, the same weight, the ponds being the same weight as the British sovereign, 0.2352 uh, ounces. So great historical angles and great numismatic interest. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Richard. And thank you for sharing your expertise in the subject. And I think definitely um, the world as we know it now could have been completely different if it had all stayed in South Africa. Now moving on to Wendy Parker. So she is uh, based in Melbourne and pivoting a little bit now. Um, how has this book impacted Australia? Hi, Wendy from Australia here. Congratulations, Mike and Blake. What an amazing book. Delighted that we're that much closer to knowing what really happened to the missing Kruger millions. You certainly have lifted the lid on one of South Africa's most baffling mysteries. In true Aussie vernacular, what a ripper yarn. I hope the book does really, really well and congratulations once again. Thank you, Wendy, and I do agree with our um, Aussie neighbours. It is a ripper yarn. Now, um, I think for me personally, the point of difference for this book um, is that it is, uh, it is unlike any other book on this topic, that for the first time it exposes Paul Kruger's oligarchic network of extended family and collaborators, that for the first time the Kiwi Thomas Brown's first-hand experiences of the plundered gold are highlighted, and that for the first time the Swiss's extensive involvement in the Tsar's gold-based economy is exposed. For the first time, possible links with the Kruger millions and the apartheid rulers are suggested. For the first time, readers are invited to undertake further investigations which link the missing Kruger millions and the secret bank accounts. Thomas Brown has lifted the lid. Mike and Blake have lifted it further. Who is going to expose more? Will it be you? Now, moving on, how do we, the important part, because we need this book to unravel those mysteries, where can you get it? The book distribution internationally will be available on Amazon Print On Demand, Kindle, Kobo, and Ingram Spark. In South Africa, you'll be able to visit the website www.lootedgold.com. And in New Zealand, book signings and book handovers tonight here at the Princess Gate Hotel, at the library, and also uh, available on the website as well. And you'll be able to see, uh, check the times for those book signings on the website as well. Payment and delivery can be accessed on the website through online banking or credit card. I'd like to extend my best wishes to the South African community where they will be having their launch on Saturday in Cape Town with the New Zealand Consul General visiting the launch as well. Do get it for yourself, your family or your friends. It does make a great Christmas gift. Um, thank you for joining tonight and enjoy reading this incredible book, this very exciting book, and joining on the journey to unravel these mysteries. 
uh, for our participants here tonight. Um, the Princess Gate Hotel has very kindly offered a 15% discount for anyone wanting to join in for dinner. Um, and I'd just like to close us off with a uh, traditional uh, Māori karakia. He karakia whakakapi. Kia whakairia te tapu. Kia wātea ai te ara. Kia tūruki whakataha ai. Kia tūruki whakataha ai. Haumie, huie, tāikie. Thank you so much for joining us this evening and I wish Blake and Mike all the best um, in this book. Thank you. Thank you.